And welcome back to the Research VR Podcast, everyone, the podcast behind the science and design of virtual reality. I'm your host, Azad Balabanyan, and with me today is special guest Avi Barzev, who is a veteran of the AR VR industry, having spent the last 30 years evangelizing this industry at places like Microsoft, Apple, and Disney. So hello, Avi. Hi. Glad to have you here. I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation that will go into kind of the history of, I mean, you, you're one of the pioneers of this industry. So I think it's, it'll be great to get that kind of outside perspective of, of how it's felt over the last few decades um, compared to today. And I also want to talk a lot about HoloLens, which you're are involved with in the early days. And more importantly, I think uh, you wrote an article for Vice that was about the um, VR, AR, eye tracking, or the, sorry, the title of it is The Eyes Are the Prize, Eye Tracking Technology as Advertising's Holy Grail, which, um, so we're going to go more into like the privacy and data security uh, topic, which has been something that we've touched upon, but not have had any like experts to really help us understand what it means truly. So I think it's going to be interesting. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Avi, how did you find yourself in this realm of virtual and augmented reality? How did you find yourself in this industry? Well, I have to think back almost 30 years. And and uh, I mean, I was always excited by science fiction. Uh, and in fact, I wanted to be a science fiction writer when I was in my 20s. Um, I wrote I wrote a novel that I haven't published. Uh, I've only published short stories, but uh, I I was just so fascinated by it, thinking about, wow, this is the future. And, and um, in fact, in that first novel, I, I wrote a lot about virtual worlds and AR contact lenses and um, things that really interested me. And then thought they were 50 years out and started realizing, well, if you want this future, if you want it to be a good future, you've got to actually jump in and build it. Writing about it is, is not enough. You can get in the middle of it and do your best. And, and at the time, I'd, I'd sort of on a whim joined a... Uh, VR startup right out of college. I drove cross country in a station wagon. The old story, I put all this stuff in the station wagon and 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 joined a Seattle startup that was going to be, you know, at the epicenter of VR. Seattle back then was huge. It had the the Hit Lab at Wa University of Washington and a bunch of startups. Um, and so we were all excited. This was like 1992. Um, and uh, the startup had some really great people in it. People have gone on to do some cool things. Um, but it didn't really have a business. <laughs> it ran out of money um, after about three months, uh, and I wound up living in the office uh, and uh, doing my best to kind of keep it alive. And and uh, that's when I wrote that novel. And and um, so we also did this thing where I'm trying to build a uh, what's sometimes called a cave, kind of a projected VR system, which is a lot easier on the eyes. Uh, and, and the headsets were really expensive and huge back then. So this was, you know, for $30,000 and borrowing a bunch of projectors and equipment, we were able to build a really cool immersive theater. Um, and it turns out the people I borrowed the uh, equipment from, the, especially the SGI supercomputer, um, that they, they kind of just wanted to see what we did with it. They were curious. And so they came and saw it. And that got me connected with Disney, uh, because they were also working secretly with Disney at the time. And they told Disney, hey, there's this guy in Seattle who's done some interesting stuff. You should you should interview him. Uh, and so I I would have never learned about the Disney project. I would have never known about it. It was a huge secret project um, and, unless SDI had, had you know gotten in there, unless we had borrowed that equipment and made that happen. So it's kind of fortunate. Uh, but then I wound up going from this company that has no money and, and very little chance to a, the best funded thing of the day, maybe outside the military, was $20 million put into building high-end VR. But at that, at that time, 60 frames per second was the best you could imagine. And we were able to do it. And we did it with Disney quality animators. We did it with um, the best hardware. The headset was all custom, uh, very heavy, very big, but it was the best headset anybody had ever seen at the time. And still better than some of the ones on the market, actually. Um, not weight-wise, but in terms of visual quality. And it was just an amazing place to have my first real job in the industry. I was super lucky to get there and to be able to have that opportunity to to work with some some of the best people. How did Disney decide that this is what they should be focusing on if, if they were the first ones to really be doing that? There were um, uh, a few very forward-looking people there. Um, uh, one of them was, his name is John Snoddy, who's actually back at Disney now running a bunch of things. 
um, with the creative director, a guy who has unfortunately uh, passed away named Scott Watson. Um, really smart people. Eric Hazel team. Um, there are a few more. Those are the, those are the principals. And they got together and said, let's, let's see if we can get Disney to put some money into this stuff. And, and the, the rationale was, this is the future. It's going to happen. So let's spend money now to build something that nobody else could build in order to learn about it. And the money pretty much went into just buying stuff that you could buy today. If you wait, if you wanted to wait 15 or 20 years, you could do the same thing, but they wanted to do it then and get ahead and understand everything. And, and so they're willing to spend, you know, a million dollars on a supercomputer here and there, more, more than one of those, uh, and have a relatively large team to do the highest quality thing anybody had ever seen at the time, again, outside of military. So, so that was, it was really just buying into the future, being able to move ahead. And, and there were no other options, right? There was, there was nothing you could get off the shelf that would be even close to good enough. So I, I'm really glad they did that. And, and I think we did learn a lot. I, I certainly, learned a lot about VR and we had, we had some great people come in. We had um, a professor named Randy Pausch who has uh, wrote an interesting paper about the, about the you know, user research about what we were doing. And I learned a lot about how to do studies from watching him. Um, and uh, it was just a great incubator or lab for, for learning everything you want to learn about immersive storytelling uh, before anybody really had any idea of what it was. It was just, just amazing. Do you, do you think there, I mean, do you have any idea of what company you would, or what place you could attribute to today that's kind of five or 10 years ahead of, of what else is going on and, but they're devoting a lot of money to doing that? I mean, I think all the big companies have their research labs now and, and they may be, you know, in places they're five years ahead. And that's the job that I've, I've had in a lot of these big companies, you know, some of the things I can't talk about the details, but the general kind of job is very similar in that we get whatever the best hardware we can, and sometimes we'll build custom hardware. And then we try to put together experiences that show what some new product might be like. Uh, and we try to find the magic. We try to find the value for customers. Why would they really want this? Not just what's cool about it, but what's, 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 what lasts? What, what's, what's really going to make an impression and keep you coming back, uh, in a way that really adds value to your life. So, so I've been lucky that I've been paid mostly for the last 25 years to go figure that out. And maybe not always 10 or 15 years ahead, sometimes three to five years ahead. But companies know that's the future. And, and there's this you know, thing called the innovator's dilemma, right? Even if you're successful, you still have to keep investing in the future or else someone else will beat you to it. And so they've been willing to put a lot of money into these projects. And occasionally, it results in spinning up something that becomes a big project and gets released. And that's that's when it's you know it gets really interesting. But even if even if it doesn't, even if it turn, stays as prototypes, we still learn a lot from it. We still we still uh, can apply that to future future iterations. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I guess perhaps going back to the '90s, how you, you were saying this is like state of the art supercomputers that you were using, and I believe like 3D graphics in the, in the early '90s was not even consumer video game level, right? Like this is. Like how did how did you also end up deciding that that's what you wanted to be working on um, 3D yeah. 3D at the time? That's just a passion I've always had. It's hard to even remember when it started, but I remember uh, as a teenager. Um, I think it was after seeing the movie Tron. I I didn't even realize this stuff was possible. But this is the coolest thing ever. And I had a I had a choice. I mean, I went to school and I, I studied computer science and actually specialized in computer graphics. But even even then, they didn't teach you all the stuff. There, there were no books on it. And I remember as a teenager sitting and actually figuring out how to rotate a 3D cube on my screen. It was a Commodore 64, actually, of all things, uh, with no advanced graphics whatsoever. Um, but it was certainly possible to create 3D graphics in a small way. And um, I had just worked out the math. It, 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 you know, Once I learned trig, basically, in high school... Trigonometry was enough to figure out how to rotate a circle on screen and then how to rotate that circle into the screen. And then, and then I said, well, things get smaller as they move away. So then looked at how to do perspective. Um, and again, there were no books. They just, just played with it. So I was always interested in this and um, lucky enough to go to college. They had a, a good computer graphics program. So I learned a lot more. But then I had to make a decision. Do I want to go down the sort of the Pixar route and make movies? I was always fascinated by the art and storytelling side. Um, but I realized it takes you know, dozens to hundreds of people to go make a movie. And that's not, that's not my style. I, I, I work in much smaller teams and, and I'm not really good at going and raising lots of money to, to go take on really big projects. 
And so I liked the real time side of it. I, I, I thought, well, that'd be more interesting. Let me do the stuff that, that very few people are doing. And so I learned a lot more about real time graphics. So the, the Disney job was a really good learning experience for that. I learned a ton about how to do super efficient rendering um, uh, in order to make that, uh, that possible. In fact, like one of the first things I did when I joined the project was I looked at how it was running and figured out ways to optimize the performance. But that was, you know, they were getting, you know, a fairly low frame rate. And I, I did some tricks in order to uh, pre-compute and cache a few things and actually got the performance up to the 60 frames per second that we needed. Um, so, so I learned a lot about that side of it and actually had a pretty good consulting career for a number of years, just helping people with whatever 3D graphic systems they have, just figuring out how to rewrite the systems and make them more efficient. Um, and that's kind of how I got involved with um, with the Second Life folks, because I came in, they had a, you know, not that the engine that I helped them write was the best engine ever, but it was way better than what they had before. They were getting five frames per second before, and then we at least got them up to 30 to 60 frames per second. Um, so so that, I just spent a lot of time on, on the mechanics, you know, and, and the rendering side of it. But you're right, the cards, the video cards back then were really um, not very powerful, right? The first cards around like the, this company called 3DFX was one of the first. Uh, a few others, uh, a friend of mine, David Ferrick, had a company that was putting out uh, video cards when they couldn't even do textured polygons. These were, all they could do was render triangles and you could color them and that was about it. Um, but, you know, it was enough. That, the, fortunately, the Disney one that we referred to was able to use super high-end graphics that, that would probably be on par with maybe an Xbox or an Xbox 360. Um, so they, they were, they were super powerful. Just out of curiosity, like what sort of, like what about it was setting it apart? Like, did you have, I guess, like have access to high resolution textures or normals and, or like real time lighting that you weren't able to do on consumer grade hardware before? Even the, even perspective correct texture mapping was a fairly new thing back then that the old texturing algorithms couldn't do division. And so therefore they would, uh, they would, everything would kind of swim when it was edge on. It wouldn't look very good. And so these, these had enough processes. If you, if you opened up the box, you basically saw these giant, um, uh, silicon cards that had a, a whole bunch of chips in them. And so they, SGI pretty much invented the parallel processing approach to it. There are other companies that had image generators, but they came in and used fairly commodity hardware, a lot of CPUs. Like I remember, like what is it, the i860 or something like that. They they had arrays of these things on on multiple different cards, and they were very good at making all these CPUs work in parallel in order to chop up the problem and make it more efficient, so that they could do things like fairly large textures. I think the limit was something like maybe 512 by 512 pixels back then. That was like maybe the largest texture you could do. Um, but uh, interestingly, there was a person at SGI, a couple of people at SGI that we worked with when I was at Disney, who later went on to figure out how to make off-the-shelf video cards work with a virtually unlimited size texture. And that's actually what enabled Google Earth originally. So the same people that I met at SGI at Disney, I later joined up with in a startup called Intrinsic Graphics. And that was one of the first innovations that, that we had. And it was a guy named Chris Tanner, did a lot of the work. Uh, Michael Jones was, was one of the thinkers on that. Uh, Remy Arnaud also helped. And... Um, that texture is essentially unlimited. It uses a special set of techniques in order to uh, load originally from disk, but later on I helped them load it remotely over the internet from a server. You could you could have a texture the size of the entire planet down to whatever arbitrary resolution you want, and there really is no limit to how fine resolution it, it can handle. But it came out of this idea that these video cards are still limited. They can still only handle a maximum texture of 1K or 2K, or maybe today it's I don't know, 32K or whatever, whatever it's at, but they were able to, to break that limit. Um, and that was a super interesting project too, because I was able to come in and, and take that code that, that Chris had primarily written, but make it work over the internet, make it work over, over 56K modems, and then add a usability layer to it, add a user interaction layer that actually made it fun and made it, made it really rewarding to kind of browse the planet and, and see things. So that, that was, that was also a really cool project. And it only would have happened because I knew the people from the Disney days and they told me they were going and doing the startup. So I was able to join as I think employee number two, maybe. Hmm. I would love, before we jump into the Google earth kind of part of this conversation, um, I, can you quickly actually describe what the Disney VR experience 
was like even i i think we haven't even mentioned the title like is it uh yeah, aladdin it, or disney sure yeah it was aladdin's magic carpet ride or or vr ride some vr somewhere in there like, changed titles a bunch and the the sad thing i'll tell you about part is there's almost no video of this thing that all i had a high definition video that i had managed to take home with me and i loaned it to somebody and they lost it and it's like there's there's just no video left of it there's only really crappy recordings but it was super high fidelity so the the imagine you know the 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 stage here is, is you you come you're at Epcot Center um, and you get to see this innovations pavilion that is inside the magic of how Disney makes VR and what we did in Florida was we recreated our Glendale office almost exactly with the desks and the umbrellas and everything and kind of looked alike and we had interns that we hire play off that they they were the ones who were supposedly creating all this stuff and some of them were really smart but their job was basically to interface with with the customers, uh, with the guests at Disney. And a select number of people, usually four at a time, would be picked out of that audience. So they would get to go up on stage in the next room and sit on what looked like a motorcycle seat. And you grab the handlebars. The handlebars are actually six degree freedom controllers. So you could not only turn like a motorcycle, but you could push them and pull them and lift them and lower them and twist them. And that would allow you with the headset on to feel like you were sitting on a magic carpet and controlling the carpet and flying anywhere you want. And the controls were a really hard problem. Like how do you, people who haven't even played video games, you got to get in within the five minute experience, they've got to become good at flying something. So that was its own set of challenges, but the visuals were pretty amazing. So it was, it looked just like you were in the movie Aladdin, the original uh, cartoon one, not the new one. Mm. Um, (laughs) And you would feel like you're on a magic carpet and you'd look down and you'd see that you had Mickey Mouse hands instead of human hands now. And, you're you're able to steer, steer this carpet around the streets of Agrabah. And as you approach different characters, they would talk to you. So you could think of it like a traditional dark ride that Disney would do, where you have the pirates who are singing their song and the dog with the bone and all that stuff. But it was interactive. These things would, would be aware of your presence and they would talk to you. And you couldn't really talk back. There, was, there wasn't that level of interactivity, but we were playing with letting people kind of choose their own story by going to different parts of the world first. One of the learnings from it was VR is so new to people that they were so overwhelmed by just being in VR and sitting on this carpet that the story almost didn't matter. They, <laughs> we, almost, yeah. we had to actually create these virtual magnets that would pull people in to see the characters because they would just blow right by them. They would be like, oh, that's just noise. And, and, and they'd keep flying and flying and flying for five minutes. So we actually invented a bunch of ways to, to put them a little bit more uh, into the story and keep them there. Uh, but it was it was tricky. That was one of the interesting learnings from the whole thing was how to get people engaged. It's it was quite hard. Uh, the assumption was just like with original movies and cinema, people didn't really have a language for it and concepts for it at first. So it would take years before people had enough experience that that, that the stories could become more sophisticated and uh, and interactive. But but for a first shot, it was a pretty good attempt. Yeah, and I mean, I guess Disney didn't really innovate on top of this after, right? They didn't create different uh, VR experiences, really, like innovate on storytelling, did they? they? They actually did a couple. It's not as well known, yeah. Okay. So there's there was this thing called Disney Quest that happened while I was still at Disney. I left in '97, so it was just starting, and I got to help a bit. And so there was a second version of the Aladdin ride that was more character based and had had a lot more story to it. Um, and I think it was it was done, you know, with a lot of the lessons that we learned from the first thing. Um, but then there were other rides. So the the purpose of Disney Quest was to make a theme park in a building so that you could put one of these in every major downtown area. And they had Chicago and Orlando more or less uh, done. Um, the business model wasn't great because I think they could never quite decide if they wanted to be the equivalent of a bowling alley that everybody goes to on a Friday night or if they wanted to be a tourist destination that people go to once. Uh, and, and sounds and, like and today, right? With v- it's the VR. Very similar. Oh <laughs> yeah. no, all this location based stuff today is exactly what we did in the nineties. The business models may work better today because the cost, the economics are different. If you can, I mean, ours, you know, we had to spend t- between 20,000 and half a million dollars per seat. And so you got to make a certain amount of money back to justify that. And so if your headset, you know, your whole setup only costs a couple thousand, you may have a business. Um, but it, but basically it was the same. <laughs> there was not much difference. People, we didn't ha- we didn't allow people to move around. They had to sit on the seat. They couldn't do a thing like the Void where they could have a wireless uh, headset. That stuff really didn't exist. But but the kinds of experiences that you were in were very similar. And this idea of using these physical things in front of you, like the motorcycle seat, and making that part of the environment, was also 
pretty well understood back then. Um, and so, you know, it, it looks like a lot of echoes and I've actually stayed out of that part of the industry because I feel like I've kind of been there and done that already. And, and this, it's, it's new, but it's also old. Yeah, no, understandable. And for our listeners that are trying to imagine what this looks like, um, actually, Road to VR did uh, does a really uh, they did a really good article when Disney's uh, first VR attraction closed in 26, 2015, It seems so. It's called End of an Era. Disney's first VR attraction set to close. So it's, we'll also link it in the description. And there's so there's pictures of Disney Quest as well as someone in the Aladdin magic carpet. Right, but I tried to look for videos of of the Magic Carpet ride, and and I couldn't. There apparently there was also a DVD version of this. I don't think it's at all the same thing. No, do you, do you know anything yeah, about that, that? I think it was done by different people. I don't think it's the same. Um, there were there were a bunch of really interesting things, and and it came out of the research that we did. There, like that, we had one ride that was called the Virtual Jungle Cruise, and that came out of ha- us having. Uh, invented a, a whitewater rafting simulator in the research group. It was built out of these airbags that could inflate and deflate. And it felt a lot like you were on the water because it could tilt your boat. If you were in a rubber raft, it could tilt it. But they only had um, a movie ride version of that. And so one of the things that I worked on when I was at Disney was take that and make it interactive. We actually used literally the same code from Aladdin. And the very first instance of that was you paddling. We put, you know, we put an oar in your hand so you could control your movement. And you're paddling over the the dunes of from Aladdin, from from the nighttime desert scene in, in Aladdin, and it was actually super fun to be rowing up sand dunes and then coming sliding down the other side. Um, for me, the value of it was it's really hard to make a game or a ride in which more than one person controls the vehicle. Like think about four steering wheels on the same car; it just doesn't work, right? Right. And so with rowing, it does work because you could just sum up the forces, just like whitewater rafting. Right. Uh, the only downside is like whitewater rafting. As soon as you put a current on that, you have a lot of trouble steering. It's it's not it, it's fun, but it's not an easy thing to do, and you certainly don't have a lot of control. So the riding over the dunes was actually in some ways more fun than the thing we shipped. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was still a really good ride. You, you'd go down this river and you'd paddle and there'd be dinosaurs. You kind of like, a, a, you know, uh, went back in time in order to see these things. And it was, that was pretty fun. And there were a few others, like, um, one of the ones I spent a lot of time on was where you design your own roller coaster and then you get in a motion simulator and then you could ride virtually ride your roller coaster. Mm. And this, this motion simulator was this big drum that would spin on a couple, on two axes, uh, isn't quite exactly the right thing you'd want to simulate G forces on a real roller coaster, but but it was interesting and fun, um, and you you got to design it yourself. So it was kind of like a precursor to games like Roller Coaster Tycoon, where you could literally put it together. But here you got to actually sit in it with the motion base and feel it. So there were some really interesting, good attractions. Um, the business model ultimately didn't didn't work, and and uh, interesting to see how people are running with these things today that are that are along the same lines. Yeah, it sounds like things <laughs> things are different, but things are kind of the same in in, in some of the business model ways. Um, yeah. I want to quickly actually ask you about this VR headset that was used at Disney. I mean, why? First of all, why is it so pointy? Like, what about the optics <laughs> makes it so pointy? <laughs> or what uh, about the display? <laughs> well, there were no LCDs back then, and okay. so uh, or OLEDs or anything that was small and light. So it's actually using CRTs. If you remember old televisions that had sure. this giant tube. In the back, uh, electron guns. So they're actually CRTs. What one of the reasons that this thing looked so good when inside, not outside, obviously it was really ugly <laughs> and heavy. It was forty pounds, and so the only way you could wear this without hurting your neck was it actually had to be suspended on wires from the yeah. ceiling. Uh, but it, when you looked inside of it, uh, Hazeltine had done a, a good job designing the optics, and um, it, it was only about maybe forty, fifty degree field of view, if I remember right. So mm-hmm. the, but that wasn't the, the the benefit of having these monochrome um, CRTs in there was that you didn't see any pixel masks. So all this screen door effect that we have mm-hmm. today, none of it, no screen door whatsoever. Uh, it was it was it was perceptually unlimited resolution. Um, the only downside was they're monochrome CRTs, so it needed a color filter that would flash red, green, blue, red, green, blue. And so when you move your head really fast, you could see some artifacts of that and around the edges. You might see a little color fringing. So that was running at like 180 frames per second, whereas the display was running uh, altogether 60 with red, green, blue. Uh, but the artists had done such a good job on the visuals. They painted all the textures Disney style. 
and the optics were, were good enough. There was no, none of this uh, lenticular lensing uh, God ray kind of thing. It was just clear and, and nice. And like I said, in many ways, better than some of the cheaper headsets you can get today. Uh, but heavy and really expensive. I think each one cost, if I remember right, like $100,000. Right. So not, wow. not practical. Well, it sounds like they used it for a number of years. So I'm sure they, you know, that should have made sense uh, one way or another. Really cut these. Um, okay, let's 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 move on to kind of like the next stage of your your career, which was working. Um, well, I, you probably can tell the story better, but working at a company that eventually was called Keyhole, and you worked on a product called Earth Viewer, which then was acquired by Google for Google Earth or as Google Earth. Yeah as it is today. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about that. Cause that is obviously it's like Google earth is one of the key or Google earth VR is one of the, the key best selling things you could do in VR. And it's starting to become one of the most important things for at least like AR, you know, AR cloud applications. Um, so you kind of have been in this space then for almost two decades now. Um, well, how did it start, w start with, and, um, yeah, kind of like, how did you, what were your thoughts initially in the late nineties when it came to like building an actual 3d viewing platform of earth? Sure. So this, this was, um, 1999, I think is when we started it. And it was actually interestingly before the dot com bubble burst, right? Mm -hmm. 2000, uh, we were originally thinking of this, this, um, you know, I mentioned about the, the texturing, the unlimited, we called it universal texturing, unlimited size texture enabled us, to be able to create a, a virtual planet where you could you could zoom all the way in from space. Um, that's the tech we had, but what we thought was, let's go create earth.com. Let's create a dot com <laughs> that will use this technology in order to let people fly around the earth and leverage all the power of, of 3D, 3D and maps together. And uh, when we started the company, it was like right when the bubble was bursting. So we actually had a lot of trouble raising funding uh, we got some, uh, but not as much as we had originally hoped. And um, but there's tons of vision. There's tons of stuff we wanted to do with it. One one of the imaginations that I was particularly fond of is this isn't just a 3D map of the Earth. It's actually more like, in many ways, a web browser that happens to use the Earth as its canvas. So instead of 2D rectangles on your screen, the whole Earth becomes the the, the giant web page in a sense, and anybody could bring their content. So we created this thing called ultimately called KML, which was a markup language for being able to create geospatial content and import it in Google Earth so that you could see it along with whatever else other content you wanted to bring. And so for me, it was the beginnings of a geospatial web uh, that we still quite haven't built yet, but, but will um, uh, build, which is essentially like the web, but not abstract, it, but really tied to the shape of the earth and what the meaning of everything is on the earth. And and we really thought of it as AR. We knew we couldn't do AR headsets back then. Nothing was really practical. But being able to render this whole Earth on your PC is a is an absolute step towards AR because it first it gets you to collect the data. It gets you to stitch together all the data you can find around the Earth and around geospatial, and including not just the vis the visible stuff, but also the semantic information. What's that? What's the point of interest? What's the street? What's the city? And so we started building the system to collect all these things together. Can you perhaps like also give the context of like, is this also at the point where um, satellite imagery was starting to become more prevalent or like, or becoming high, higher resolution or also or were maps starting to become open source so that you can combine the two? Like how, how what was like, yeah, the the, um, yeah. the things ar happening around your company that, that led you to be able to create this? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, a few years earlier, um, uh, actually, Al Gore deserves a lot of credit for this. Uh, and I know, you know, people made fun of him for their claim that he said he invented the internet, which he never actually said. But, uh, but one of the other things he actually did help with, apart from helping to fund the internet, was this project called, um, I think it was the Digital Earth Initiative, if I remember right. It was something like that. I think that was the okay. name. And the, the goal was to declassify all of this military satellite imagery so for the for exactly this kind of reason, I don't know if he imagined a 3D viewer at that time, but um, but even just having access to those satellite imagery uh, was useful for all sorts of things outside of uh, security. There is useful for planning, it's useful for mapping and routing and navigation. And so he pushed really hard to make it so that these 
uh, geospatial companies with satellites could declassify the imagery, maybe not all of it, but enough of it to be useful. And so we could go buy it. And that was, that was at a very enabling, fun without that, you would basically have to have planes fly in the air privately, collecting all this data, uh, which they do, but it's expensive. Um, and eventually, you know, trucks driving around every street to collect the street level data, which also is obviously done and also very expensive. But we could start with something that was not too expensive, which was the satellite imagery and stitch together the whole planet and then work our way down to finer and finer uh, levels of resolution. So that was absolutely enabling. Without the digital earth, hmm. I don't think there would have been a possibility of having this company. Um, and also, obviously, other, other enabling technologies was the video cards had to be good enough to be able to do 3D texturing the way we were doing it. And the internet itself had to be good enough for people to stream data. And we designed it to work for 56K modems, right? It, it, it could work on a very low end connection, but even 56K back then was not something everybody had. And so it's still the infrastructure is still not quite there. The server infrastructure as well. There were no there were no clouds that you could go you know lease space on. You had to go set up your own servers and get your own network connection. Um, well, there were a few companies that did this, but they they weren't really set up for anything that we were doing. So it was all hard. Um, it was all it was all you know new and interesting. Um, and anyway, those those are sort of the enablers. And that learning was very important because some of the same people, if you look at follow their trajectory. So our CEO is John Hankey, who's now the CEO of Niantic, the makers of Pokemon Go. Um, he was always interested in this space and um, especially, you know, had a, uh, an angle on the gaming side of it uh, coming from that background. You had Phil Kesslin, who um, handled all the backend server side stuff and became the CTO. And he's the CTO of Niantic as well. So there's a lot of this, you know, cross synergy today with things that we see in AR that we kind of cut our teeth on on PCs back in the you know in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, and uh, the guy, for example, that I hired to create the terrain for Keyhole is also at Niantic working on who knows what. But really, really great developer named, named uh, Dave Kornman, who's who wrote some really awesome uh, code to be able to stream uh, height fields and geometry so we could make the terrain look 3D. Right. I was going to ask, how was that done? I mean, you're, are you applying some, I guess, older topographical maps on top of the uh, imagery and yeah, extrapolating was, that way? There, there were some topographical maps that were available. Hmm. Uh, I think I can say the word topographical again. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and other data came from, I think there was a mission called STS that NASA did where they went and mapped uh, a lot of the Earth and made it available. So there was, it wasn't, it was never as detailed as the color imagery that we were able to get, but it was mm. good enough to be able to create hills and mountains and, and valleys. Uh, and what we had to figure out was how to stitch that all together. Uh, the guy who was responsible for that, his name was Mark Aubin, and his job was to get all the data together and to digest it so that we could put it on a server and stream it down. Uh, the part that I spent all my time on was on the client, on the user interface and the interactivity and the rendering. Uh, of this, things like hmm. how do how do you render street labels, right? I, I didn't, I'd never done cartography before, so I had to learn hmm. a bunch. And it turns out nobody had ever really done real time cart cartography. Yeah. There was they, they had to invent ways, like in a couple of milliseconds, figure out which street labels and city labels you're going to render. You can't render them all; it would be a big mess if you did. So you got to have a system that can figure out, oh, here's a city, so we're going to put the city name here, but we're going to make sure that we're not drawing any other names. Right. for a few inches on either side so that the city really stands out. And we can put the road label anywhere we want, but where do we put it that's most useful? So all that stuff we had to figure out from first principles in a lot of ways uh, and make it all run in milliseconds because it had to run at 60 frames per second overall. That was an absolute requirement for us. So it was, it was fun. There were a lot of really interesting technical challenges to make that work. I see how all of these things are converging into, you know, what what you're working on today or like what, what people are doing today. It's really fascinating kind of seeing the the context of, of how these things emerge, like especially even the 60 FPS, you know, that being a requirement and that's being something that you worked on before uh, for VR. And now that's yeah. a clear requirement for real time. We, we knew from experience that if you, if you sacrifice frame rate, you can still make something, but it doesn't feel magical. You never get to that level of, Oh, wow. Cool. Until you can get rid of all the artifacts, all the things that hold people back. Uh, you have to you have to really spend a lot of effort to make to go the extra mile to make those things pretty amazing. Uh, I guess the other thing though that sort of riffing on what you just said is is no one company has the resources to collect all this data. Certainly not a startup like Keyhole, 
but even the big companies today, um, no one is going to be able to map the earth and create this so-called mirror world or AR cloud uh, by themselves. And so it was a big passion back then to kind of be the front end that could integrate all the various back end data sources together. Uh, and it's something I've stuck with because it's just clear that no one is going to ever have enough money to collect all this data and source it, nor would we want them to. We wouldn't want any one company controlling our perception of the world. So being able to design a system that allows everybody to bring their own data and share it in a way that they're not just giving it away for free, but they can bring it and, and maybe even you know, rent it uh, so, that, so that people can use it, but they still have a business interest. Those are really hard problems and things that I've been uh, working on solutions to for, well, even, you know, since then, but, but at multiple different companies as well. So I guess 10 years ago now, in 2008, you had a interview with, uh, in, in a publication called Cartography, Car Cartographica, which I guess is about maps, as you might imagine. Um, so you, you talked about a few things there that were really interesting that I think are super relevant today. Um, First, one of the things that stood out was you said some of us, myself included, were wrong in thinking that the internet wouldn't uh, that the it, internet wouldn't be explorable until it was properly represented in 3D, and turned out and that 2D interfaces were just fine for most people, even better in some ways. Um, how I think we're probably in a sim very similar situation today when it comes to AR and VR, where we have like really high expectations of things that need to exist before. Any of these tech, like both VR and AR, are useful. Can you do you think you can make like a comparison to? Um, I guess you might have to extrapolate, like you know, like you can't see in the, into the future, but like how do you think we're thinking of things about AR today that are probably we're extrapolating incorrectly into the future, where they it still would be useful even without the crazy amount of technology that would be required to build uh, what is said. Does that make sense at all? No, absolutely. It's a it's a really good question. So. Uh, yeah, so what happens a lot of times, you know, as a designer and a technologist, you, you start loving a technology and thinking, oh, this is going to solve everything. Everybody should come use this. But when you have real customers out there, they don't care. They just care about what they're trying to do with it. And so you can spend all this time making the coolest thing ever, and it just, it just doesn't matter. And so a lot, of, a lot of what I've learned over the years is how to tap into that value statement, that what, what do customers really need? What problem are you really trying to solve that they care about? Um, and then you could throw all sorts of really cool technology under the hood if you need it in order to make that solution happen. But don't ever brag about the technology because, because people mostly don't care. Early adopters do. Everyone else doesn't. And so focus on that, on that value. And that's, that's for the last 10 years, what I've done inside the various big companies was help brainstorm and then prototype new ideas that try to show the value in new areas of technology. And some of them I can talk about and some I can't. But the general theme is always don't just assume people like it because it's new and, and cool. Uh, and, and a good example of that is if you think about um, 2D on your phone. So smartphones have all these great apps on them, and there's a huge reason to go buy a smartphone. If someone was going to go try to figure out uh, AR glasses, the thing that they're going to have to grapple with is this question of always, why can't I do that on the phone today? What, 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 what is it about this use case that ha absolutely has to be done in a head-mounted display Spatialized, overlaid on top of the world. And if you can't answer that question, you don't have a product. You can't move forward because somebody else will come along and make a cheap clone of it that runs on a phone. And that's, that there was, there was your great idea. And so every time we'd come up with an interesting idea, we had to run it through that gauntlet and say, well, well, wouldn't that work just fine on a phone? If phones, maybe phones need to be improved a little bit in certain ways. Maybe they need to have better facial positioning so they know where they are more precisely. And maybe they need to have better cameras a better battery life, but, but they're the basic platform. It's a pretty good platform for doing a lot of really great experiences. And so just asking that question can invalidate some of the things you thought were cool about VR and AR that you just don't really need. Now, that said, there are things that are really unique to AR and VR that you, you do need it for, and that's why they're here. That's why they're interesting. Um, Google Earth VR is a great example. That's a great app, I, you know, other than working on Keyhole. Uh, you know, 19 years ago, uh, I don't have anything to do with it, but but it's really cool, and it's one of the first things I always show people in VR because anybody can get into it, and they always do the same thing. They take you to their house, they show you where they grew up, and and it's 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 not perfect, but it's easy enough to use that almost anybody can get into it. And they did a lot of work, and it's it's really impressive, even better than what I had seen. Um, 
you know, a whole array of TVs running Google Earth before where you could be kind of be immersed. But this is this is still a, a step above. So that's an example of something I don't think you could do any other way. Um, you wouldn't want to do that in AR because you want to travel someplace else. So VR is actually the best vehicle for an experience like that. Uh, and, and just, you know, it just shows the value of just doing something really well and, and having the quality bar really high. Given that how good phones are today, and especially paired with something like an Apple Watch or a, some of the wearable tech, um, becoming even better year after year, are you, it's at least to me, it's starting to become harder and harder to try and sell an all day AR, uh, an idea, even to understand like what it's going to be better to do it through AR for. I mean, are you, how, what is your overall impression of AR today, having had a broad view of it? And are you still kind of bullish, bullish about AR? Oh, yeah. I'm very bullish about AR. Um, I think that having gone through the exercise of trying to figure out what, what are those things that you can't do well on a phone, uh, there are plenty of things that require uh, real AR. Um, the challenge has always been on the technology side and making sure that, you know, there, there's definitely value there, but there are also limitations to what people are willing to do. I, I don't like wearing glasses. I, I wear them to read. I, I would choose not to wear glasses unless they had some really strong beneficial power. And I'll give you one example of, of one of the ones that we patented at Microsoft was, you know, I'm, I'm now, you know, 50 years old, I'll be 51 soon. And I've lost a lot of accommodation, so that's why I wear the reading glasses, right? Uh, I never needed it before. I always had perfect vision. And um, if I had a pair of glasses that could simply know what I was looking at and adjust their focus for from between near and far, I, uh, you know, I, I believe that's a billion-dollar product without any AR display. All it has to do is do that well. And but the form factor has to be very small. It has to work all day long. It has to be able to accommodate a large number of prescriptions, some of which make that problem really hard. If you have any kind of asymmetry, astigmatism, things like that, um, it becomes very hard to use any of the available technologies in order to achieve the thing I just talked about. And so that's one of the reasons you haven't seen anybody make a product like that is it's, it's just really difficult to do, even though if you were to make it, it could be a billion dollar product today. It would be totally worth trying. Um, but a lot of people say, well, it's still too hard, so we'll do we'll do stuff that's that's easier, uh, stuff that's that's earlier, and that that's a smart move uh, from an investment perspective. But it's but it's uh, it's not necessarily following the the value of all the use cases. It's a sort of more pragmatic in many ways. But the other use cases, as, as long as people can figure out what, the answer to the question of why would I wear AR glasses or contact lenses or anything else, why would I wear these all day long, if it's augmenting my day constantly, that better be a pretty subtle thing. It better not be yeah. that I'm constantly in this sort of this psychedelic, hypnotic, alternate universe. That That's not where I want to live. Maybe some people might, but I, I want to live in the real world. I want something that makes my interactions with other people better. I want something that makes me smarter. I want something that gives me uh, superpowers. It's something I've written about a lot. Um, and so, you know, while we don't have to get into all the details, if, if people want to know my thoughts on this, on this whole Superpower issue. There's a, another set of articles I wrote specifically about what are the really valuable use cases for AR, uh, and I still believe those. I have I've not seen anything yet to invalidate those things. And they include things like way in the future, not anytime soon. People are going to be recording their lives and streaming their lives for other people to participate remotely. Um, and I like to call it life streaming and life surfing. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but ultimately when the technology becomes ubiquitous and everybody has it, that's one of the natural things you'll see. You'll see the, you know, the Twitch and the, or the Periscope or the YouTube uh, come on top of these technologies in order to make them very mass adopted and, and just sort of part of the fabric of everyday life, which is also why it's important to get it right. These things are going to be with us for a long time. I mean, I think someday we're going to solve direct brain interfacing and be able to not have to wear anything that would be able to just directly jack in to whatever whatever worlds we want, that's still a ways off. I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. And so AR and VR are going to fill the gap um, by putting all the devices on your body instead of inside your, your, your nervous system. Um, it's going to be a, a good 20 years of AR tech, I think, uh, being the dominant form of, of interaction for, for quite some time. Uh, we got to get it right. We've got to make sure that it's not exploited. We've got to make sure that people are empowered. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I like the superpower conception because it it doesn't 
you don't conceptualize things in terms of, oh, we have to make a social network that makes us lots of money. You conceptualize it in terms of how am I enabling individual human beings to have a better life than they have today? <clears throat> what are we adding to their lives that can actually be useful? If we can answer that, then we have a product and we have something that people will want as long as the tech works. Do you think, especially companies like Apple, they will, um, and looking at how the Apple Watch kind of, I think Apple Watch is almost like a per perfect thing to, to, to look at as a way to conceptualize how like perhaps glasses will be sold at the end where the first generation really was, didn't take off. I kind of wrote it off for the first couple generations. And then over a few generations, I realized that the health element of the watch really became the selling point. And it, it still is today. I bought one to do sleep tracking and to do, um, you know, like cycling tracking and, and whatnot. And th those are the primary use cases that I use it for. Um, but with glasses, you can imagine the the depth of the you know biometric data that you can have to actually have have it really be a big part of your health tracking every day, to the point that you don't want to not have this device because you think you're in you know the, you know the fall detection on the watch like if you're an an older person you're most likely going to be always trying to wear that so that in case you do fall you will have that. Do you think that's like the perfect Trojan horse into people's lives where they don't think? They would want an, an AR device, but in fact, it's kind of going to going to be important for their health. Um, Am I thinking about that correctly? Or I think I think those are good thoughts. I want to be careful about not sure. saying anything specifically about Apple. Um, but, you know, I uh, the one statement I'll made is that you know I made a promise to to my coworkers that they would get to disclose anything they wanted to disclose <laughs> about whatever they want. So I don't want to be the one to you know assume that I have the right to to, to say anything. Um, about whatever Apple is or isn't interested in, um, but I, I I can say that I, you know I think I think that you're thinking of the problem in general well, and that there may be a certain set of use cases that are just more interesting than others. Even though you could imagine, and again, just I'll use I'll use smartwatches in general as an example. People for years were talking about the Dick Tracy watch. I want to be able to make a video call on my wrist. That's all people talked about. And they said, where is that? And well, it turns out that's not a great experience on your wrist. You, you don't want to hold up your wrist and see a tiny little postage stamp sized copy of a person. If you're going to, if it's going to be that bad of an experience, you might as well just do audio. It's the audio is rich in many ways. You, you're not, you're not degrading the experience with, with the visuals that aren't going to match it. And so the things that people conceive of for years and years may not actually be the things that stick. So health may be the best use case. Uh, some people think notifications are one of the, the best use cases for watches as well, though I, I don't want to be that notified. I, I don't want to have instant access to all this information because I will spend all my time on it, and I have other things to do that are more important. So, so I think I think that you're generally right. But but for AR, I don't know that health is necessarily the one. It could be, um, but I think that the thing I've said a lot, and, and I'll repeat, is I think the one that is the most important one for AR is communication. I think that um, there, there's nothing really great out there yet. People are using um, various means to simulate in-person communications, both in VR and people are trying in AR. None of the technologies that, that's out there is ready quite for, for doing this well. Um, but I think ultimately the ability for you and I to feel like we're in the same room together and just having a conversation without seeing all this technology, that's the, that's the most important use case. And it's still the one that's the hardest to pull off. You know, this the point would be so much more salient if, if we were still doing these podcast conversations in VR that we have been doing for the last few years. And unfortunately, damn it, big screen, why did you have to change how you do multiplayer rooms? Because it really, yeah, it does really drive home the point. There are a lot of options, though. You're, you, you, I, I agree with you. This certain, sometimes companies come along and they solve it and then they unsolve it by making decisions that are not uh, helpful. Um, and, you know, but I, I, I do think that um, for VR, this idea of co-presence of, of people being in the same place together is really powerful, especially when you can go places together. If you're gonna, if you're gonna virtually come visit my house, I don't, I don't know that I want that experience to be a VR experience. I might want that to, to feel more like you're actually in my house and I see my house as is. But uh, if we, you and I want to go meet, you know, in in Italy and have this conversation, that might be great too, right? Yeah, or, or Jedi Council wise like have have the person be in a room and likewise you you're in their room and and you're making eye contact <laughs> funny funny you mentioned that because the, the yeah the star wars actually depicted this mostly well not not perfectly like there uh, there are cases where they have a handheld hologram unit and the character is looking at a miniature version of the person they're talking to 
and somehow the miniature person is looking at them <laughs> yeah, and the geometry looking, doesn't really add up. Like, yes. like the, the only time they really got that right was in, um, uh, in the Star Trek. Recent... Did... I don't know if you've, I'm oh, sorry, go, go for it. I'll... <laughs> so Star, Star I'll... Trek did a good job of this too with the holodeck, but I was going to say in yeah. Star Wars, the scene where, uh, where Snoke shows up as a giant head on the deck of one of the, mm. uh, Empire ships, he's looking down you know, at, at the, you know, at, at his henchmen and they're looking up at him and that kind of works. But the, 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 where they depicted it best, I think was like you said, the Jedi chamber where everybody kind of has a seat and they're all, they're all able to see each other with the right angle. So the, the most important thing in conversation is that we know when we're looking at each other and we know when we're talking to each other and we're making mutual eye contact and this thing in psychology called joint attention that if I look at something, you know that I'm looking at that thing. And so I could just say that, and you know what I mean. Whereas on a phone call, you don't have that at all. You have no idea what I'm pointing to when I say that right now. So so they did a pretty good job there. What were, what were you thinking about for Star, for Star Trek? Then? Well, Star Trek, it wasn't even the holodeck, but it was the when Picard is speaking into you know the video screen in front of him to the enemy ship, every time they have a like a wide shot from the side, they actually do have a different camera angle from the side of the person they're talking to. So they were simulating a volumetric screen where um, you have different perspectives looking at the screen, not being flat. I don't know. Like, it's a very easy thing to miss, but if you're watching Star Trek Next Generation, realize that the screen that they're talking, the video chat screen is actually a volumetric display and yeah. they have different camera perspectives for the, the, for the video. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah, I think you're right that they, they do make it feel like it's just a piece of glass and the, the starship on the other side that you're talking to is somehow just next to you and connected and everything just feels physically correct. Right. Uh, I think that's true. Most of the time, sometimes the person they're talking to is this giant face that has decided to be ominous for, for whatever plot based reason. So I guess, okay, going back to AR, um, the, I want to, I want to, I guess, pull out a few things that you had in the, the vice article in terms of like the really awesome benefits that you can get with AR and especially with eye tracking. Well, um, one is security and, and identity actually lot, like never having to type in a password in ARVR again. And in fact, there is there is a patent that was filed by Ifluence back in like 2015, 2016, that now they're part of Google. And they were the only people, at least the, I was the first time that I'd really thought about continuous biometric uh, authentication being a, thi- an, an, a big part of eye tracking. And I was like, oh, that I'd never have to type that in again. That's, I mean, I'm guessing that's a huge element of this, a new user experience. Um, having to never you know, do the certain things that we're all so used to from the 90s. It's true. There's positives and negatives, though. That, that, and, and in the article, I go into some of the negatives, too. That you know, The positive is, yeah, you shouldn't ever have to type in a password. Although the reality is you still will. Like, hmm. if you notice on your phone, whenever you reboot your phone, you still have to put your pin in, right? Right. There's a, there's a security reason for that. Um, and But then once you validated once, you can then use, you know, various light, lightweight forms of validation to, to, so that the system knows that you are you. Uh, it is important because a lot of the data in this is going to be very private. And so a company who's being very conscientious about that is going to make sure that any data they collect is stored in a way that only you can access it. It's, it's ideally stored locally on the device so that it never has a chance of being intercepted mm-hmm. or subpoenaed on a server that, that out of your control. Uh, by having it on the device, you can make sure that somebody just literally has to steal the device before they can get your information, which is, is safer than not knowing where it's going and who sees it. Uh, so those are all those are all good things. The downside is, you know, a there's no anonymity anymore, right? That the, even if a company claims that you're anonymized and they're giving you some, you know, na- some long string of digits that represents you that doesn't have your name in it, you're still not anonymous, and that's kind of a a lie to say that you're ever anonymous. Once you have biometrics, just it just goes out the window. You, you, the system always knows who you are, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not willing to use certain products on the market because they have not yet promised to keep that data secure in such a way that it will never be used against me. They're just collecting it all, and so you know, uh, Jeremy Balenson at Stanford uh, VR has demonstrated that you could identify people from the way they move, from their body. You don't have to necessarily use eyes, but all these things mean that anybody collecting this data could re-identify me even if I was thinking that I was anonymous. So, so that's just, they need to just cut out the whole anonymity thing. It's useful for a few things. It's useful for aggregating a lot of information, like finding out what city do my customers live in 
that's a, that's a useful thing to do anonymously. But as soon as the data is specific to one person or one even one kind of person, you've kind of lost that. The other thing that, ha that can potentially happen with biometrics is you better really protect it because if that data gets out there, if there's a, a breach and hackers now have your iris, uh, what's to stop them from printing a contact lens that has your iris on it and then pretending to be you? Uh, there's really very little and it's very hard to change your eyes. Uh, the, if I was ever compromised with eye tracking, I'd have to wear contact lenses all the time in order to pretend to be someone else. Now I've lost my whole identity. So it creates this can of worms and you gotta make sure that the companies, and I'd encourage people to really ask the companies before they go use these products and say, what are you doing to protect this data? How are you making sure it's my, my data is not gonna be used against me? And if the company can't answer that or if their policy, privacy policy doesn't, doesn't specifically say what they're doing, I would just not use it. It's, it's not worth the risk at this point. What are, I mean, how do you determine that? What are your criteria that you you know, determine a product or even a website that you're visiting, whether that satisfies your needs? Well, I think they could be clearer. It's actually a little bit of a passion project of mine is to try to write uh, a new way of doing privacy policies that is more like nutrition labels on food. So, and not everybody will look at it, but anybody could look at it and understand how the data is being used. So I look, I look at the privacy policy and if it's written by lawyers and it's not understandable, forget it because it, it may be the best in the world, but if you can't decipher it, it's not worth your time to try. The, but what, what I look for is that they're telling me specifically what are they collecting and how are they going to use it? What's the disposition of it? And as a, as a other requirement, I also want to know how long they're going to keep it. So tell me that you're collecting my biometrics. Tell me that you're collecting my motion data. Tell me how it's going to be protected so that uh, rogue employees can't see it, so hackers can't see it, so the government can't subpoena it. Uh, tell me how that's going to be protected and then tell me what you're going to do with it. In the case of Facebook, I'm very concerned because in the same privacy policy, they say, we're going to collect all this information and not tell you exactly why we're using it. And they also say that they can use any information they've collected for marketing to you. So I don't know that they are doing this, but they could do it based on their terms of service. Use ultra you know, creepy personalization in order to show you things in VR or AR that will get you to buy things. That will be actually manipulative in a, in, a, in a very strong sense more so than any ad you've ever seen, that they could effectively steer you to making certain decisions based on everything that they know about you. That, to me, is scary because I know I'm vulnerable. I know everybody is vulnerable to that kind of manipulation. Just think about any time you've been upset about anything, did you act rationally? Did you make bad decisions when you were upset? We all do. And if they know how to push your buttons, if they know what gets you upset, they can do just enough of that to get you off, off kilter a little bit. And then, and then you become highly suggestible and they could get you to vote for somebody or vote against somebody or anything based on getting you charged uh, uh, after they know this stuff. So I just think we got to be really careful. I know you're not against uh, using ads as a monetization service. In fact, you even talked about that being OK for maps. Like if you as long as it's not distracting and or annoying, you're like, you know, that's if something's going to be free, it's most likely going to be monetized with ads. So how I mean. When I, you know, when I, I'm, I'm currently living in Europe now and pretty much every website I go to, I, there's always a pop-up for GDRP, you know, you have to like either accept cookies or not. And it's, I, I try to deny, but it's like, sometimes some websites are harder than others. And even if I do read it, like I typically don't know how to really like what to do with this information. Like, okay, you're going to track me. That sounds bad. I don't know particularly why. And I know some companies obviously are more intrusive than others in terms of what they're tracking, but I think the average person, you know, apart like like myself, like doesn't really know what to do with this information, even if it's like really clearly stated that we are all this data about you that we have and we're going to use it to market it towards you. Like, I don't know what to do with that information. So I guess my question to you is, you know, as a subject matter expert, like how how do, first of all, maybe if you're a developer listening to this, like how do you approach this entire bundle of this clusterfuck of <laughs> data privacy, um, and and yeah, kind of maybe we maybe you could you can talk about as an advice to developers like how do you how do what are they supposed to be doing with this and users as well. All right, so I think that uh, first of all, there are, there are a lot of legitimate uses for this for the data that we collect, and also as you said, I I do believe that advertising isn't inherently evil. Um, it, it it actually is useful to learn about products or services that I might like. Uh, and I might not know them any other way than advertising. If, if so, so that, that I'm not knocking advertising overall, and I think that as a business model, it certainly 
you know, an, an interesting one. That, that, that it, the problem with it is that it, it kind of has this long-term corrupting influence that, that if a company really is making its money, and especially if they go public and they have this pressure to grow 20% every year, eventually they're going to keep relaxing their own safeguards. Whatever they thought on day one was the limit, that gets pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. Uh, because that's the only way to make more money, right? You could, you could either add more users or you could make money from each user, make more money from each user. And so one of those two things has to happen or both. And, and, and so that over time, these things get to be more and more corrupted. So I say first as a developer, first decide what your principles are, like know what they are today. And I, I would say publish those, publish those really clearly in your privacy statement saying, this is where we draw the line. This is what we are willing to and not willing to do. And one of the things I'm playing with is, Without creating stigmas, would it be possible for third-party developers and or platforms that they use to call out the differences in privacy? So I might make the most privacy-centric platform in the world, but if I allow a third-party developer to come in and they decide, like Cambridge Analytica, that they're going to use this data that they, that they scraped uh, for nefarious purposes, what can I do to stop them? I can shut them off, uh, but the most important thing I can do is to call them out. I can say that they're doing this. Uh, and uh, say that their privacy policy differs from what we believe in. And I think that that public statement of what we believe in and what, what we think is acceptable is going to vary. The people, different people have different conceptions of it, and it's okay. But it just has to be a, a clear contract with the customer. So, for example, going all the way back to the Disney uh, experience, we did user testing on people, right? It was legitimate. We asked their permission. There's something called informed consent, which means exactly what it says. You have to actually inform people, not just with a pop-up, but you have to make sure that they understand that this data is going to be used in this way, and they have to agree to it. If they do, and they're adults, I don't see a huge problem with collecting the data and using it, but they have to know. So the most important thing right now is, as a developer, just be really clear and open about what you're doing. Don't hide. Don't worry so much about the fact that some people are not going to like it. You'd rather have the customers who are willing to do what you want them to do than the ones who feel that they've been betrayed once they find out it's not what they wanted. And I've been through that. I was in a startup I won't name. And the biggest challenge that I had was saying no to the people uh, at, at senior levels who wanted to sell user data. And then I put my foot down. But it, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to, when a company says this is the only way we can make money, either you have to survive, right? The, the, the survival is the, the, the base of the pyramid for, for, any com for any company. They have to get to that point. But maybe there's other ways of doing it too. Maybe there are ways of being able to make money that don't require ultra personalization and showing people exactly what they need to see for, you know, for uh, advertising marketing purposes. Maybe there are ways that we can enable people to create commerce in, in virtual places and that commerce itself could be self-sustaining uh, in terms of uh, a, a vibrant economy and ecosystem that doesn't require this external uh, tap of data. That's, isn't that what DuckDuckGo, like that's their whole you know, perspective is that they don't need to, it doesn't need to be very specific to the user, but they can kind of do contextual based ads rather than um, like a really deep dive Google user based ads. And like, does that, act, is that actually, I, I don't know if it works, but does it actually work? Or is that kind of like a pipe dream? Cause it sounds like it would be worse as a, as an ad service, right? For that, if it's knows less about you than in the ads that it's, that's being served to you are less relevant, but yeah, I think that, that I think it's, it's it's true that you could like the the ad that makes the most money is the ad that the company who showed it to you can prove to the to whoever is invested in, in that product that it convinced you to go buy the product, right? That if I really want to make a ton of money, I will I will figure out a way to show every you know product maker that I can get customers to come and buy the product uh, for the the, the the minimal amount of effort and money. Uh, spent, and so that's worth it. That's what that's what the advertisers want, and so they they, they really do want this ultra personalization because it means that there's less wasted uh, ad time. Uh, ads that don't go anywhere may not you know be worth their time, but you just don't know ahead of time. So this so one of the things that Facebook apparently did was rather than giving out the names of people who are upset about various political issues like. Uh, you know, somebody might completely vote against the candidate because of their stance on abortion or taxes or something that somebody's really passionate about. So what they did was they grouped these people together. They clustered them and said, here's a group of people who have a really strong 
opinion in this direction on, on abortion. And then a company like Cambridge Analytica can take that and they don't have to know exactly whose name it was. They probably did collect that information, but they don't have to. They just have to be able to put the right ad in front of the right person in order to, to manipulate them. So, so bucketing isn't, isn't a complete solution to the, the, the problems the, of advertising. But uh, I think the most important thing that people can do is to say, let's draw an ethical line. Let's actually say, if, if this ad is manipulative, if this ad is encouraging people to act against their own interests, uh, then that's not a good ad. That, that's not a good thing we do. And, and Facebook could be monitoring those things. Facebook could be looking at all the ads on their platform and judging whether a particular ad is over the line or not. Uh, they don't. They, they, they want to be considered a common carrier and they want to act like they're all neutral in this whole thing, but they're not. They're obviously not neutral. They're giving, they're giving benefits to people who want to be exploitive. Uh, but I think that's where the responsibility comes for any company is to say, here are our standards. Here's what we're willing to do. If you agree with it, you're a great customer of ours. If you don't, then then don't sign up. Don't do it because we're going to we're going to do X, Y and Z. Uh, I can't go around telling people not to make money. I can't go around telling people to give their things away for free. They, they have to make money, uh, but they can do it ethically. It's certainly possible to do. And, and some companies prove that. DuckDuckGo is a good example. Um I think that, you know, I don't talk much about Apple, but I will say I think Apple does their best to make sure that the data that they that they collect about you is stored in a way that is on your device and it is private. And even their own engineers can't see it, right? You have the key, literally the encryption key to seeing that data. Uh, and I think that's a very admirable stance. In fact, I, I, I didn't even consider joining Apple until the San Bernardino case happened where Apple stood up to the government and said, no, we're not going to crack our operating system for you. Uh, that you, you need to find another way. And the government did find another way. They were able to go um, hire a company to go solve that without Apple having to disable everybody's operating system. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess, also worrying that there are companies that can do that. I think that was the interesting uh, revelation apart from, you know, Apple sticking up. Um, are you concerned that, you know, the next computing platform is being built by essentially the same big four companies that are dominating today? And that have some, you know, each each has its own business model and some deviate from, you know, Apple is, I think, a much more of a hardware selling company. And now they're pivoting into also selling subscription services, but less so about ads and Google, Apple. Well, sorry, yeah, Google, Facebook and Amazon, Google and Apple are sorry, Facebook and Google are uh, much more ad like 90 something percent ad based revenue. And Amazon, I guess, can also probably be fit into that bucket as well. I mean, it, does this, I know you've said that you're a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist when it comes to, um, when it comes to privacy and, and ethical usage of this data, but how do you, I mean, how do you think about the future when it comes to that it's being built by these companies? Yeah, I, I, I know you're you. walking on, you know, uh, little yeah. shaky ground, but <laughs> I'm, I, so I'm not going to address, uh, NDA issues that I, sure. that I can't get into. So, but uh, I will say, yes, I do think in general, the big companies are all racing to solve what is the future of computing. They, they've, they've said as much. I don't think anybody you know, has said they're not interested in that problem. Uh, and they all have different approaches and they have slightly different business models. So I would tend to favor the companies that actually sell things directly, that mm -hmm. sell products, uh, because that business model is less exploitive. I mean, yeah, the companies may use marketing to make their things seem cool and you know, there's always that. But at the end of the day, it's a very straightforward transaction. If I like this product, I buy it. I use it. If I don't, I go buy a competitor's product and use that. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's what's okay about it what, makes it, what makes it ethical is the fact that it's an it's a understood transaction, that there's nothing really secret or hidden about the whole thing. So as long as the companies are doing that, I'm, I'm in their, I, I favor what they're doing. Because some of these things can only be done by big companies. It's really mm. hard to create a new set of hardware, a new operating system, a new ecosystem, and applications on top of it. There are only a few companies that have the resources to be able to do that. And I do think that they will dominate in, in the near term. Um, long term, once the hardware is out there, you will, I'm sure, see the Linux of AR. Uh, in fact, I would love to help work on that because I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the open source side of things. And that will eventually exist. It doesn't make a lot of sense to write that before the hardware's out there because there's nothing to run it on yet. But 
it, eventually there will be these alternatives that that are not sourced by the big companies, and that's that's a good thing. But I think the first step, the first iterations are going to have to be from big companies. And even the startups who claim that they're not the big companies. I mean, after you've raised four or five billion dollars, are you a big company? I think so. I mean, at that point, you're not a startup anymore. You're, you're, you know, you, you have 2000 people, you've got billions of dollars that you're, that are churning through your accounts. That's, that's a, that's a pretty big uh, bet at that point. Yeah. As much as Magic Leap wants to still feel like a startup, it doesn't seem like it to the outside world, at least. Yeah. I think, I think that they're, I think they'd be happy that I say that they're in the same league in many ways, <laughs> but uh, but on the other hand, they also have the same issues that they're going to have to figure out how to make money. And I haven't really, I, I've heard that they're going to announce something at SIGGRAPH about their privacy policy. I'm looking forward to seeing it, but thus far, uh, I haven't seen anything that says that they're going to be on what I consider the, the right side of privacy. I have seen various patents or comments go by that says that they may have ads. And that may be one of the ways they fund things, or they may partner up with cellular companies who sell your, sell your data in other ways. They all, all the cellular phone companies have been selling your location data for years without asking you. And that's not okay. So I hope that, I hope that Magic Leap is going to make a really positive, strong statement about privacy and, and we'll see. Well, hopefully we'll find out soon. I think so. All right. So closing questions. Um, you back to this um, this article from ten years ago or the interview that you're in. The, when Google Maps was coming around, uh, this interviewer was asking you whether you were worried about this open source or free version of a mapping tool being out there, and if, if, it, and if it will hurt kind of GIS uh, applications that are professional and you know, cost a lot more money. Is the, I guess over the last ten years, kind of what has changed uh, when it comes to mapping, and and have you know has the has the ground completely changed or the playing field completely changed because of uh, Google Maps or Bing Maps now and um, the open source versions? I, I think definitely there are things that have changed, and I've I've learned a lot too in the last ten or fifteen years about this stuff. And I think I I've always been a big fan of crowdsourcing because right there's there's no more scalable way to build a map of the world than if you could use everybody's cell phone to take pictures. And that's one of the things I worked on at Microsoft was, you know, related to the people I work with that were working on Photosynth and Bing Maps. It's like, okay, if you're if you're a trillion dollar company, it wasn't at the time, but if, if your trillion dollar company is not willing to spend the billion dollars on collecting the map data, then how else are you going to put what together this this mirror world? Well you're going to Build applications that give people value, but also collect world data, data about the scene. Um, and then I've realized a lot more about what that means in terms of privacy, that, that there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with that when you are relying on crowdsourcing the data. There's intentional manipulation, and Google had to deal with people using their tools to make giant penises in the desert uh, because they were available, and eventually someone will do something like that. It's, it's inevitable that somebody will troll. Um, but also that the fact that the the street view data that, that was collected is potentially revealing. There were people who were naked or there were people who were doing things. Uh, and and uh, street view was able to be used as a tool of surveillance. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be. I think there, there are ways that this technology can be refined such that we get what we really want, which is the map of the world. And the people are not casualties of that process, that we can be safe about them. And what they do today is they blur the faces. That it's, a, it's an okay start. Um, I think it came about because of the privacy laws in Germany going all the way back for 15 years. Uh, and now with GDPR, it's a little you know, more, more uniform. But, uh, but I'd like to see them and other companies doing Street View products actually removing the people. Just, just go ahead and, and digitally try to remove them and fill in the background based on other shots you've taken. And if you want to build a Second life on top of the map. Go and add the people again virtually, but but don't you know don't don't capture those people. And, and now you have this again with all the internal home stuff. People want to use your phone in order to build maps of your house. If you have a, a Roomba, it's building a map of your house, but it's probably not seeing the papers on your desk. But holding up your phone is going to see things that you would probably consider private, like your phone your phone bill is sitting on your desk uh, when you were taking pictures. That that could get streamed up to the cloud if we're not careful. Uh, companies that are working on this, uh, some of them talk about this, like um, 60 AI, uh, my, my friend is, Matt is the CEO, has talked a lot about the fact that they 
try to strip out the people and also the details of things like credit cards or papers. And that never leaves the phone and it, that shouldn't go to the cloud. Uh, but the shape of your room could. Even then, you still have to be concerned. For example, if if I have a home security system and cameras, uh, how, I don't want that information going out because then a burglar knows exactly where to bypass it. They have all the plans they need to be able to uh, figure it out. And at the very least, they can decide, is this a house they want to hit or not? They can decide that this house is rich because they have a lot of art. Uh, so, so all these things have to be careful. To be quite honest, I mean, you people, are, I'm sure they already do that, but I think I've even read that they look for pools at houses, you know, from, from Google or Google Maps and you're like, okay, that's a more valuable house than the one next to it. So that's, and then you go into street view and you can, you know, do a little bit more planning. So it is going to get more higher fidelity and you can imagine, but I guess the question is like, who, <laughs> which one of these companies do you trust and, and which one is going to be the more secure with this data so that you don't have Cambridge Analytica's uh, happening again. I think, don't, don't you think like really the bigger, the biggest issue with especially eye tracking is maybe even if these companies have really great policies and, and, you know, in America, like we have great, uh, security and, and the government won't use this data against us to, to identify like political targets. But like, let's imagine a totalitarian regime where they do care, they do want to have full access and control over their people. Like, and, <laughs> the, you know, for providing them really rich information about their the current emotional status of each citizen, like you can imagine the 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 problems that can come from that. And you know, some companies that maybe your Western companies won't won't comply, but like you can have other other hardware with other software from other companies that um, do. So, I guess I don't know if it's an it's a impossible battle to fight, but that's that's the sort of thing I've, I've been thinking about recently. I think in the U.S. here, where I am, it, 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 it's, it's a mixed bag. I think that you see you know, cities and police departments in, in some places say, we want to track everybody. We want to know where everybody is. And they employ facial recognition. Uh, the government has been pretty bad about protecting this data. There was a breach of the Homeland Security System where they had collected everybody's faces at major airports and other ports of entry. And I went through that, too. And I had my face digitized. I didn't like it, but I, but I did it. it. It's less hassle than saying no and having to go through other means. Um, and you know, you're know, you traveling with a family and you just, it's not the time to take a political stand sometimes. But when they had a breach, I'm like, oh my God, now, now I've given into this thing uh, that I didn't want to do in the first place. And then they were, they were completely negligent and, and, uh, and allowed a vendor to have the data and, and lose it. Uh, that's not okay. And it's really not okay if the cities are going around trying to collect every license plate and every face they see in order for the simply the, to have the, the the questionable benefit of knowing where everybody is at any given time, it's really not that useful for law enforcement as a as a as a tool. It is useful for oppression. It is very useful for for figuring out who is plotting against the government, but it's not very useful for figuring out day to day uh, crimes. There's plenty of other tools that are better in forensics. So so I don't encourage that. I'm really glad that San Francisco took a stand, and other cities are now taking a stand, saying. No, we're not going to use that. At least the city is not going to use that. Can't, they can't stop a private company from doing it. Uh, and unfortunately, even where the government in the U.S. has said, no, we're not going to do that legally through federal law, they, they can't buy on people in certain ways. They turn around and agencies will then go contract with companies, private companies, who will do it for them. So they have basically you know, violated the spirit of the law, if not the letter, by going and doing this mass data collection, but they just happen to make the company rich in the process, uh, and that that's that's really not uh, that's not in our interest either. Uh, I think if we had a little bit more transparency in terms of what our officials are doing and more accountability, that wouldn't that wouldn't be so much of a problem. Yeah, I think a lot of them don't even <laughs> they have never even thought about this because they're like they don't come from this generation of dealing with digital data, and so I can imagine. There's a lot of discrepancy between like what's happening in a private sector versus public. Um, can we also put a bookend in terms of uh, I've seen a few th uh, like Reddit or Twitter threads that come up about like worries about using public data to do research with uh, things that have been publicly posted by human beings or even just things that they've said or, or tweeted and then use that as, uh, you know, let's say anonymized data to, to whatever extent that it can be, but use that to actually understand what is happening in public. And I've seen research about like, you know, looking at um, 
language that people use and understand like emotions that come from that. Um, I think what I'm referring to is like the Google research, there was a Google research paper that was like using a videos of people in the mannequin challenge, which is people, everybody, everybody stands still and then a camera moves around. And so they're using videos that were posted on YouTube of the mannequin cat challenge to train, uh, their depth mapping for kind of like volumetric video conversion from a 2d video, which I thought was like a really interesting thing. Cause I'm like, I do a lot of photogrammetry and so having people stay still is like a very hard thing. And I hadn't thought about that. And so there was like a Twitter thread and it was like complaining, like, this is what they're using with your data for. And, and, and I, I don't know, I felt that that wasn't like a, a total huge pro like privacy violation. And I, and I asked a few researcher friends of mine, I'm like, am I totally wrong about this? And they're like, no, this is kind of common. Like there, as long as you an anonymize the data um, and you treat it properly and, and like, you don't need to have, informed consent from every single user that has publicly posted things like is like am i thinking about that correctly or is that also how you think as well i think i think that uh, technically they don't they definitely don't uh the, the the terms of service according to their theory that you signed when you started using youtube would allow them for this use sure so i'm sure a lot more too but and a lot more too and then yeah. And and it's not just the only example that I I don't know for sure, but I I, I would reasonably guess that you know Google bought Grand Central, uh, this sort of phone routing, you know portable phone number thing, back I don't know what fifteen twenty years ago almost, uh, right around the beginning of it. I, mean, I think oh, but kidding me, twenty years, but but let's say let's say ten to fifteen years, um, and that was a, a service that a lot of people used to route their phone calls. I I would not be surprised if they used the voice data from that in order to train their really excellent speech recognition uh, models that, that their terms of service would seem to allow that. Uh, and, and, and you could say, well, what's wrong with that as long as they're not revealing any of the private information that people spoke? Um, I think, I think the, the main issue is that people aren't aware that it's happening and they may be unhappy about that use of it. Uh, what I would like to see happen is that people can express on their content what the rights are, right? That that Flickr had, you know, early pioneering in terms of Creative Commons and being able to say, I think it's okay for you to use this picture of mine uh, commercially. I don't care. Use it. You don't have to give attribution or you have to give attribution or, you know, you can only use it for non-commercial purposes. They, they gave a lot of granularity. And I think it would be great if people, you know, on sites like YouTube could have that same level of control. So if they don't care, that's fine. But if they do care, um, then they, they could actually specify and say, I mean, they have some control, but not, not the level that I think we really need. The argument is always, we don't want to make it so complicated they don't, that people don't like setting up complicated things. But some people do, and some people want that control. And if you go through the trouble, if, if YouTube and Google go through the trouble of giving the 1% of the people who don't like it the chance to opt out and everybody else doesn't care, then it's hard to say there's anything wrong with it at that point. But the default parameter is still like uh, it, it is still that you can use it for research. And I mean, technically, there's so much research that has been done just with public data, like with the before the Internet. Right. With just researchers standing in university campuses and either observing things or asking people things like like or just observational research. It does not require informed consent. So I think I just found it kind of funny that. I, I, I'm very bold. Like, I think privacy is extremely important, but we shouldn't like apply, like we should be careful about how, what we create outrage around, I think. Yeah. I, I think like you, there, there's definitely a line. And, and I think an example of where, you know, when Facebook was caught manipulating people's news feeds yes. in yes. order to measure their emotional reaction, that's over the line that, that requires informed consent. Uh, but I, I do think that, you know, collecting a bunch of pictures of public things, uh, or not. Now, the issue, I guess, if you want to go back to just this, this uh, challenge, is the places that, the, that these pictures were captured, a lot of them aren't public places. Uh, so Google's only argument is that, well, they posted these, so therefore it's okay. But I don't think anybody's posting these pictures with the intent that they're allowing mining to happen and they're enabling. So, so again, if they just make sure people are aware if they give people this granularity to control how these things are used, I think it, it can be made okay. It could be, there's a line that can be drawn that says some things are okay and some things aren't. It needs to be clarified. People need to understand it. And, and we should speak out about the things that are outrageous, uh, but we don't have to lump everything into that, into that bucket, as you're saying.
Avi, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, how can people uh, find out more about your work, perhaps your your Medium posts and your Vice article, um, and uh, how they can contact you? Uh, so they can follow me on Twitter, which is just my entire name at you know at Avi Barzev, uh, no dash. Uh, and I do have a, a Medium uh, uh, account that I do update every once in a while. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, I had, I used to have a blog. Uh, I've, I've now obsoleted the blog, and it's just a company site. But anything really big, I'll put on that as well in terms of new articles or new things that I want everyone to be aware of. Uh, I'd say right now, Twitter is probably the most up to date uh, in terms of the things what, that I'm doing and talking about. Cool. And uh, yeah, and all of that will be in the description so that they can find the links. Great. Great. Thank you, Avi, for uh, joining us for another podcast of the Research VR podcast. And thank you all for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.